A very warm welcome tonight to this webinar organized by the Churches Refugee Network of Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. I am Bishop John Perimbala. I chair Churches Refugee Network of CTBI. And in this webinar, our focus tonight will be on immigration issues in Britain and Ireland. As we reflect and discuss tonight, we keep in our mind two special layers of our immediate context. One is COVID-19 pandemic, which has brought out all sorts of issues in relation to the most vulnerable people. And the second is the new immigration bill, which is going through the parliament at the moment uh, in the light of Brexit uh, transition period ending in December. So we, we keep all that in our mind. We are dealing with a complex set of uh, issues uh, in relation to our support for uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And we gather together tonight with that commitment to serve the most vulnerable in our society. So it is very important that we discuss, debate, and raise our voices wherever we are able to. So let us pray as we begin tonight. We pray for ourselves and for our society that we face tomorrow with compassion and fairness. Let us pray. God of constant assurance, God who is forever new, we acknowledge that a life of faith is not without risk. There is no telling what lies ahead when we choose to let go of what has been. But as we set off on this next adventure in the life of our society, of finding our newer and truer selves, remind us that it is in becoming that we remain the people you created us to be. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now hand over to uh, Reverend Sally Thomas. Uh, Sally Thomas is the moderator for this evening, for this webinar. Sally is a United Reformed Church minister and is a member of the steering group of Churches Refugee Network. Over to you, Sally. Thank, thank you, Bishop John. And good evening and welcome everyone who is with us this evening um, for this one hour webinar hosted by the Churches Refugee Network. And we'll be exploring, as you've heard, immigration matters in Britain, Ireland, Scotland and Wales with particular emphasis on, on COVID-19 and now the, the immigration bill. So as Bishop John says, my name's Sally. I'm part of this group. Um, earlier this year, just before lockdown, actually, I relocated from ministry in Wales to minister with two churches here in London. So I'm now working with Bayswater and Kensington. So I just simply want to introduce our speakers for this evening. From Scotland, we have Olivia Nadoti, who is a Zambian national studying at the um, University of Glasgow um, in community development. And she's also very engaged in the injustices with it within um, communities uh, and we're looking forward to what you've got to say Olivia that's great and then from Wales we've got Reverend Alid Edwards OBE who is the chief executive of Coteen so a former colleague of mine look forward to whatever you say Alid it's always interesting then we'll move to Ireland to Dr Eben Joseph who is a um, lecturer and module coordinator black studies in the University of Dublin and then finally but by no means least, we look forward to hearing from Jonathan Ellis, who is the project director of the Detention Forum, and who I only learned this evening chairs um, London Citizens. So, Kroisoff, welcome, all of you. Um, and welcome to, as I say, to everyone who's on this webinar. 
As we proceed, and all of you who are, who are part of this are listening to our panelists, please will you formulate your questions and send them in using the, the Q&A option in the, in the, um, in the Zoom. Um, we'll do our best to include all the questions at the end. If yours gets left out, then I'm very sorry, but we'll do the best we can. Can't promise we'll answer everyone, but we'll see where we go. A lot of this depends on the speakers sticking to their brief of 10 minutes each. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. So, but um, I know it, it's a big ask, but there's so much to be said on this huge topic. So, um, as I say, we'll move over now to our speakers. Um, if you do need to start winding up, I'll, I'll just indicate to you if that's okay. But I'm sure we'll be fine, and we look forward to all we have to to, to learn, um, all we have to think about, and all that will come to challenge us this evening uh, as we go forward. So, first of all, I invite you, Olivia, to address us. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, and um, um, thank you for, for having me here. Um, so I'll just go straight to what's been happen happening more in Glasgow and uh, just from my experience and from the people that I've supported during the COVID-19. Uh, so we're all aware that this was like unexpected and um, although nothing was put in place for asylum seekers because we didn't see this coming, um, it really affected them quite badly. So you're looking at single moms with children and including men, men as well. But sadly as well, it's with people like with no recourse to public fund. Like on 27th of June uh, the, in the national, they wrote that about 1.4 million uh, without access to public funds. So this also includes to also illegal migrants who were not probably not included in these statistics, but also asylum seekers that were like in Glasgow, not receiving their 35 pounds a week that was cut off from them the ones that were staying in the hotel um so we saw that most moms uh did not know what was happening they had no credit in their phones so with the organization called migrant uh, rights organizing and empowerment had to phone all the time to credit their phones so that they can keep in touch with families and friends and also to understand what was happening but sadly enough is a um, most asylum seekers had no IT equipment in their houses, so they had no TV to listen to what was happening. They were living in limbos, actually. They felt so hopeless because there was no one and they, all the organizations were shut. Uh, so this, this has really been like a hard time and difficult time for, for everybody else in Glasgow. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, the no recourse to public fund has really made uh, asylum seekers to, to really uh, be affected more um, with the immigration policies and, and all the support networks that were meant to support them were shut as well. Um, I, I don't know what to describe this, but it was pure inhuman treatment and, uh, and I hope this would be uh, the way forward would be maybe ready to, to plan and, and help them. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to pause here uh, because my time is right in my bed. Can I just pass it on back to uh, the moderator to, uh, to pick up the different speaker, please? So, sorry, um, Alexander. <laughs> What would you, was it you just said? I was going to pass it on back to you to pick a different speaker. Um, just got my son jumped onto okay. my room. So then, so we'll come back to you in a few minutes, okay? Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then another speaker yeah. just okay. on. Thank Alan, you. Alan, are you ready to jump in? Yeah. Th thanks very much. Um, lovely to be with you, and thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, good evening, and as we say around here, Noswaith uh, Ba. Uh, I hope you can hear me uh, and see me well enough. Um, just to give you a, a quick 10 minutes of the distinctive Welsh approach um, and some of the challenges that we've had on the immigration front uh, around COVID-19. We've uh, become more aware, as I'm sure the people of Scotland uh, have as well, of the devolved nature of the islands that we live in at the moment. So um, we've become aware that we can have greater protections in Wales, uh, that we will do some things quicker 
uh, some things slower. And there has been a sense here that that more cautious approach by our First Minister um, on the whole has been wise. Uh, but what has possibly uh, gone under the radar is the way in which we've had a very distinctive approach uh, to BAME issues, black and ethnic minority issues, um, and also to the uh, asylum scene. And that's got a long-standing um, heritage. Uh, back in 2001, um, the churches were very active when um, asylum detainees were kept in Cardiff prison under remand conditions. And it was then that we first learned that the partnership between Wales, uh, Wales's faith communities and uh, the Welsh Government could actually impact on um, immigration issues, making sure that those detainees were removed from those conditions um, fairly quickly. Uh, I should probably tell you that in 2001, also post the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack in New York, uh, the then First Minister decided that we should have a um, faith communities forum in Wales. And that was an interesting dynamic, not only in terms of including faith communities, uh, but also in bringing um, uh, minority communities on board. Uh, for the first time, I guess, the uh, Muslim community in Wales was heard, as was the Hindu community. And that dynamic has always br brought those huge diversities um, of Welsh life together. And that has been uh, part of the dynamic that helped shape uh, the COVID conversation um, just at this time. The other major historical uh, key point was that back as far as 2010, uh, the churches indicated to the Welsh Government that it would be a good idea perhaps uh, to make Wales a nation of sanctuary. And that process was in full flow uh, when the COVID-19 crisis hit us. Uh, but we had already put in place processes to monitor what was happening to refugees particularly in terms of health um, and in terms of social well-being. What COVID taught us, and it taught us very quickly and very tragically, was that we soon ascertained in Wales and elsewhere that it was a terrible plight that disproportionately affected on the poor, but it disproportionately affected uh, on uh, Black and ethnic minority communities, the BAME communities, and we found obviously that those on the front line in the NHS uh, were disproportionately um, affected by it. But also what we found was that the social conditions in Wales, poverty, zero hours working, housing, poor housing, poor job prospects, also impacted on the disproportionate number of deaths. And that triggered a mechanism both in terms of providing a toolkit in terms of the NHS in Wales, to protect key staff. But I was one of the um, task force set up to explore the socioeconomic reasons as to why so many people were dying. And we acted at great speed under the leadership of um, Professor Emmanuel Ogbon of Cardiff University, who brought us all together and we prepared uh, a, a list of recommendations to Welsh Government as how we could save lives um, and improve the conditions of BAME communities here um, in Wales. And I'm delighted to say that the document was very well received. It's accessible there for everyone to see on the uh, Welsh Government web website. And the recommendations were taken up instantly uh, by the Welsh Government. Then, of course, we had to encounter the challenges of what happened in America, in Minneapolis and many other cities. And what we found was that the Black Lives Matter dynamic uh, brought a great change to us. We already had a standing um, race uh, forum set up by the Welsh Government. But what we discovered was that we had to have a broader conversation very quickly. We had a webinar, a national webinar in Wales, and that brought about 90 people together. And then at the height of the um, Black Lives Matter, protest that uh, weekend there was so um, such a paradigm change and shift in the UK. Uh, we had a, a virtual protest which attracted many many thousands and what we discovered in that process and churches were part of that endeavour. What we found of course was that new voices appeared 
on the scene, young voices, black voices, Asian voices, and many of those voices were informed by faith. And that has introduced a very refreshing, uh, fresh dynamic into Welsh politics, though we are now beginning to move beyond the uh, traditional gatekeepers uh, to people who function very much um, as gateways. Um, and that, I hope, will implement a great change. What was also noticeable at the height of the um, statues uh, issue here um, in Wales, bearing in mind that we were very close to Bristol and were very much aware of what was happening in that city. We had a major drive to remove uh, those memorials to the slave owners of Wales, many of them with very poor legacies. And what has happened is the Welsh Government has set up uh, a commission, a committee to look at this issue, led by BAME individuals and communities, and that will begin that process of re-educating and having a national conversation of how we approach um, immigration. We've been very mindful as well of what's been happening in the worldwide scene. Uh, picking up very, very much the uh, preaching of William J. Barber II from North Carolina, who has been very much at the forefront in America around Black Lives Matter and also, of course, the issue um, of poverty and the disproportionate number of deaths there. I've been mindful of a, a visit that I had on a sabbatical um, towards the end of 2018 when I went to McCallan in Texas. And that was the place, the epicenter of the child um, separation policy of the Trump administration. And just this uh, past week, over the past few days, uh, Jacob Soparoff has written a very powerful book, a record of what happened then called Separation. Um, and I would recommend to everybody to read it. It tells us of how government, um, as a matter of policy, can set about to do great harm. And this presents us as a challenge uh, for a worldwide Christian community, how we exercise a prophetic role to change that scene and to challenge people when they do a great ill, bearing in mind that thousands of children uh, were separated. And then finally, it leaves us with a question here in Wales, and I guess to Britain and Ireland are probably one of the greatest legacies that we now have, one of the greatest challenges set before us, is that we truly become prophetic and that we say in the face of some wrongs, whatever government perpetuates them, that we will not be silent. The time for silence is now past and there's a great obligation on us as churches and as faith communities and as people of values to say that we will be true to our Lord and that we will insist on changing the world. So thank you, Sally. I look forward to the other contributors. That was excellent as ever. Thank you very much indeed. And, and in under time, I, I am so impressed. Thank you. Um, Olivia, would you like to pick up where you left off or go to someone else? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, from, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll pick up from where I left from. Sorry, what was that? I can pick up from where I left from. Um, okay, great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. so, um, what I was trying to say was about, um, I think I left on, we've already had an article that was written uh, in the National saying that there was about 1.4 million um, without access to public funds. So this did not include um, asylum seekers uh, and other illegal migrants as well. Um, I think this pandemic found uh, most organizations in Glasgow are not ready for for how to advise asylum seekers on, on closing because um, a lot of families ended up to really, uh, they were experiencing food poverty, uh, digital poverty, so, so they lost out on communication really. Um, they were living very hopeless. 
and it's really caused a lot of fear and, and panic and anxiety into uh, feeling so left out. Um, they don't feel like they're part of this society. So we have a population that even when we were planning on uh, how to reduce the, the spread of COVID-19, they, they, they were not informed because they, they either didn't have credit for their phones or they, 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 they were just waiting for someone to phone them and inform them. Um, I was doing some work for, for the three banks uh, for migrant rights organizing and empowerment. So most families, when I phoned to check on their well-being during the COVID-19, uh, they were mostly in tears. Um, I still I also have some evidence that I was writing down and in my phone as well. Even men just phoning, um, sending messages to say they were hungry. <laughs> Basically, they were crying that they were hungry. They had no food. Uh, they had no money. Uh, and the food that they were being given, the ones that were staying in the hotel, uh, also just um, were experiencing mental health impact. And, and, and we're looking at the incident that happened in Glasgow as well, uh, the hotel, um, the, the, the guy that actually committed um, the crime was going through mental health uh, issues. Um, I came across most of the guys and, and basically wandering about in the street with no masks as well. Uh, they were told to wear a mask, but they had no money to buy anything. And you wonder why this part of the population that living in the same communities is with the British people were left out um, and even up to now. So there's nothing that was really put in place for them. Uh, and, and this is a developed nation and uh, we've left them to just go on wandering about without anything. Uh, they're so lost that they don't feel so like they belong anywhere. And the little things that we have that we can support with, we're, we're just trying to help out as well. So, the organizations themselves in Glasgow, they've tried their best, I should say, to support, to come out, even to risk their own health as well, uh, to go and support asylum seekers that were in the hotels, and also those organizations that quickly rushed out to go and um, drop food, food parcels to, to their homes, arranging for, uh, for children who didn't even have iPads to engage with their teachers as well, asylum seekers, families, they were left out on also logging on to online programs uh, while the other population had classes and lessons arranged and moved online. So asylum seekers children, most of them who didn't have uh, IT equipment were totally left out for this, this period of, of, of the, the pandemic. Um, we, we've arranged, I had a TV and a small iPad that I've arranged to send to uh, a mother and say another one was she couldn't even speak English. So you're looking at the language barriers uh, made uh, these women to just feel more like they were just, I think it's more like they were left in a jungle just to, with no help, they're waiting for help. And I, sh I should say up to now, it's more like they're leaving to say, when is help going to come for us? And then we had that new immigration policies that came up on Monday. Uh, it caused more fear for most of them now. Uh, to just go through that, but I can take you in a, a over just other things when when the questions are asked. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Olivia. That that was that was worth waiting for. Thanks. Um, huge issues you're raising there. So we'll move on, and we'll go now to. Um, to Ireland now, and we're talking to um, Dr. Eben Joseph, who's our next speaker. I'm sorry, I hesitated there. I can't see her face on the screen. Do we still have her? I'm still here. Good, um, good, good. You I'll, need to I'll let... unblock my video. It's been stopped by the host, so I can't, un I can't share my video by myself. All right, okay. okay. We'll wait for Richard to do that. Okay, I think that's what now. Great, let me see you. Over that's to you, perfect. thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, it's just been brilliant, you know, listening to um, the other two speakers, you know, just talking about what's happening in, in Wales, you know, um, and, you know, and, and so as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking of what's happening for us here in Ireland. I think that, you know, even when we look at it, one of the things when we look at immigration and people who have migrated to Ireland, one of the key things we begin to see is a, a return to the policing of black bodies and not just black bodies, but the policing of bodies, you know, through, you know, through 
um, trying to keep people safe, you know. So again, we're talking about COVID-19. We're saying, okay, you know, there's lockdown. We're controlling movement. We're policing movement. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're noticing is that the people who are more policed, you know, the more different you are, you know, from the main population, the more policing that, you know, people are experiencing. Um, you know, if you see in Ireland, the first set of people who were um, penalized, you know, for breaking the, you know, the the distance, you know, the, we had a, when we first had the, this, the, the lockdown, you know, um, and it was a two, two kilometers from home that you couldn't go. The first set of people who were, you know, um, penalized for it were people, you know, people of migrant descent who migrated to Ireland, you know, just recently, just today, actually, there's a a 33-year-old Chilean woman who was a 33-year-old Chilean student who was coming to Ireland, you know, and she was arrested. She was stopped um, by immigration at the at the airport, at the Dublin airport, and she was kept in isolation in prison, in a female prison, for almost two weeks. I don't think again. I was checking it, checking it. They don't need visas to come here. So something about a risk. She posed a risk, which you know. And this young woman um, had just lost her father two two months ago to COVID nineteen. So imagine that trauma of trying to come to Ireland, you know, and being kept in prison, a female prison, you know, for almost two weeks in isolation. Imagine the mental health, the mental torture. You know, and, and she was just released. And, you know, we're all making noise about it, you know, online. But again, it's just for me, is that return to, to the policing of bodies, you know, and that we've used that and the victims, the major victims of this policing, you know, are, are immigrants through the immigration system, through migration, where we've had an increased policing, you know, and again, even before COVID-19 hit, we already had it, you know, where, and not just in Ireland, but, you know, across Europe, where we had come to a point where we were criminalizing care, you know, and, and, as, and as a body of faith and as faith people, you know, care is one of the key things that we've been asked to do. You know, one of the biggest commandments we've been asked to do is care for others, you know, is to love others, is to show, you know, show love and care in a way that it can be seen. But we criminalize care because we categorize people and we call them names. You know, and so I come to the to the next thing. It's just around how you know with COVID nineteen, the naming of people has become more significant again, and the kind of name that we give you, you know, begins to determine what you can and cannot get, how you can be treated, and you know, or how you can be mistreated. You know, so again, so we call some people asylum seekers. So when we've called them, we've grouped them under this name and this title. What it does is that we deepen a personalize them we don't see the humanity in such people and it frees us as nations you know to perpetuate the inequity you know within our systems and so what we're seeing here in ireland as well is that you know those names have come to the fore again so you hear it a lot you know oh asylum seekers as if that is to justify the the treatment you know or the bad condition under which people are living you know so we're beginning to see all of those um namings you know um and all of that when we when we you know I, I was listening to you know your stories you know from you know other from the uk particularly and from the us you know so what you see there is that you know during covid you know we had data and statistics you know that showed that you know people of black asian ethnic minority groups were most hit you know most impacted by covid in ireland we do not have we did not collect um, disaggregated data so we did not know you know, and there was no way that in Ireland it could have been um, any different from the UK or the US. It was the same thing, but that data was not being collected. And so key things that I began to observe, because I, in the month of May, what I did was I ran webinars. I ran four webinars every Thursday in the month of May to change the narrative, to talk about it, to get people, to get the nation talking about it. So I ran webinars. I mean, like each of the webinars had over 200 people each in, in each of those webinars. One of the webinars, we actually had 330 people in it. You know, so that was good because people were beginning to talk about it, but we, I, 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 I targeted the visible racism because what began to happen was that racism began to become more visible. You know, we began to see the name calling, the, you know, the identifying people with a particular category, you know, began to become more obvious. But one of the things that struck me the most was that 
in places like the UK, in, in the US, you would find that, you know, black, Asian, ethnic minority doctors, you know, and um, healthcare personnel, we are the ones who were actually coming out to say, we have no PPE, this is what we're suffering, this is what's happening to us. In Ireland, I still cannot, I'm, I'm think. I'm looking around, I cannot find one being black, ethnic minority, you know, doctor who came out to say, you know, we're being, you know, this is what we're experiencing in the healthcare system. And so what that says is, it's not that it wasn't existing. It, it's not that the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, that black or ethnic minority groups were more impacted. It's not that. But what it showed me was the level of oppression within our systems, that these people were not able to come out, to speak up in public, you know, for fear of, 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 you know, the repercussions, because we pay a price. I get trolled, totally trolled, like, you know, in Ireland, like anytime I come and say anything about race, I have like, you know, I think this year alone, when I looked at my, you know, the number of trolls I've blocked on Twitter, my God, the numbers are just astronomical. The emotional energy you have to use to do that, because in Ireland, we still keep, you know, coming back with this, oh, race is not an issue, racism is not an issue. But we realize with COVID-19, that we were suffering from two pandemics, you know, one of the pandemic of COVID-19 and the other was the pandemic of racism. And so we, we you know, when we were hearing all of the things about, you know, um, race and ethnicity being a pre-existing condition, one of the webinars we ran was to actually say, no, race and ethnicity is not a pre-existing condition for COVID-19, you know, the, the coronavirus was not going around saying, hey, here, that's a black body. I'm just going to get into you and kill you. No, that wasn't what. The coronavirus was not saying, oh, that's a black doctor. Or that's an Asian doctor. He wasn't doing that, you know. So what was making it? What was making them more susceptible? Why were they being more, you know, so again, we, we began to see things, you know, the discrimination within our systems, you know, where, you know, where, where PPE were not being allocated equally people, you know, or where, you know, people are not able to, to state their rights, you know, unqualified people being sent into maybe, you know, a higher danger zone, you know, because again, at the end of the day, we look at it, you know, you're an immigrant, you know, through immigration, you're dispensable. You know, one of the languages that we had in Ireland was, you know, and I'm sure in the UK as well, is that we began to, the language change, we began to call, you know, immigrants, we began to call them essential to work. You know, we began to call them essential workers. You know, we looked at them and we clapped for them every day. You know, we were calling them essential workers. But these were the same people we fought and we said, oh, they are taking our jobs. Oh, you know, we don't want them. Oh, you know, there are new policies from the UK everywhere, you know, where we keep trying to push these people out. But with COVID-19, we saw a change and we began to call those people essential workers. You know, there was a, one of the webinars we went and it was really apt, you know, and the speaker said, actually, no, they are not just, they are not essential workers. They are essential to work. And that's, there's a difference there because the minute they stop being essential to work, what happens? We get rid of them. We push them, which was what we were doing again. And we go back to Brexit. We go back to all of the arguments we made against immigrants and against immigration was all of these things. But with COVID-19, we realized we needed doctors, we needed nurses, we needed people who were expendable, you know. So again, we pushed more of the people of migrant, you know, people of migrant descent and our, our being workers, you know, into those roles. So again, so we're looking at all of those things and the dynamics. I think for me, it's for me in Ireland, one of the key things that was really, really sad is the lack of our BAME voices, our Black, Asian, ethnic minority voices coming out to speak. You know, it, it, it just makes me wonder at the level of, you know, the, the kind of relationship, the dynamics in there. You know, again, I've done research, you know, one of the webinars we had, you know, somebody who had done research with doctors, you know, talking about just their fear of being able to come out to speak up about things like that. You know, so we look at them. Um, all of that. So we see that, you know, so, so we, so a lot of, um, issues, you know, that come up when we look at, you know, with COVID-19, you know, and I think, you know, um, one of the persons, you know, mentioned that as well, just to see that, you know, with COVID-19, 
COVID-19, we had it, and then racism came on top of that. So it revealed, you know, even unto us, you know. I don't know if you saw it today, like one of the statues, you know, in, 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 in the UK that was pulled down, the Edward Colston statue, you know, has been replaced by a, a Black Lives Matter statue, you know. So I'm like, okay, God, I hope they allow it to stay for a bit and allow us to enjoy it before they either pull it down or, or you know, do something terrible to it. But the last thing I will say, and maybe leave the rest to questions and answers, is to say that, you know, that as faith people and as the church, I think we need to remember that we have history, we have knowledge, you know, about plagues. It, you know, the first set of plagues I read about before I heard about all the ones that happened in our physical world, I read them from the Bible, from the good book. You know, so it tells us about the plagues. It tells us about how they welcomed, um, you know, famine and how they welcomed, you know, uh, uh, people who, who, you know, asylum seekers or people who were seeking help. So the church you know, and faith people really have a good, a huge part to play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, um, Jonathan, we, we move to you and we look forward to, to hearing from, from the England perspective, from, from your experience. Thanks very much. Sally, thank you and a good evening. Great to be with you all this evening and great looking at the attendance list to see so many familiar and good colleagues down there. So great to be with you. Um, I want to, in this incredibly bleak and challenging time, I want to this evening try and offer three, I think, potential opportunities of what we can do emerging out of this crisis. I want to focus on immigration detention from our role as project director in Detention Forum. I want to talk a bit about destitution uh, with some work I've been doing around a new campaign around destitution. And I want to talk about the vital importance of embedding a culture of welcome. Um, not, in my, not in a capacity, I should say, I'm not associated with London citizens, but I am very proud to be national chair of City of Sanctuary UK. So the first one, detention. As, as many of you will know in, in this country, we, we, we have this horrendous practice of arbitrary detention, indefinite detention. And we, we have the worst record in Europe of being able to detain innocent people indefinitely who've committed no crime, but they're being detained because of their immigration status. And what we have, um, we've been questioning for years that there should be a far more humane and just way in terms of, a, of a, an immigration system. And what we've seen through the, the crisis is huge numbers of people being released from detention centers. Sadly, not all. The last figures I saw around 254 are still there, but we have seen a massive release of, of people and the sky hasn't fallen in. The world hasn't stopped. And it's kind of possibly showing that there is another way do we need to have this expensive, lazy default position of resorting to immigration detention? Or, or is there a better way? Is there a, is there a community-based approach, a far more sensitive way of responding and supporting people uh, in this position? Um, and I think with, this, with, this num with the numbers being reduced, do we just go back to where we were? Or do we make the case that actually, why do we have? Why do we have such reliance on immigration detention and above all can't we see a time limit and we were so disappointed a few weeks ago in the immigration bill that uh, the amendment moved by David Davis MP wasn't successful but we're going to keep pushing on this and we need a we need coming out of this crisis we need to focus on people not systems within the immigration system we need to end detention because I think we've proven time and time again that it's not, not just and it's not humane um, and I think what this crisis shows is that detention need not be the answer and let's be courageous and let's push for real change. So my first message there is a potential message around hope that we can, we've shown that people can be released, the sky doesn't fall in, let's keep pushing for change. The second issue I wanted to focus on was and is destitution this kind of quaint Victorian type word that we use um, that basically says that people have no means of support, no job, no, no home, no nothing. And, you know, we, we, we have a humanitarian crisis in this country of people who have no means of supporting themselves. They could be refused asylum seekers. They could be international students. They could be migrant domestic workers. They could be, they could be British people excluded from universal credit. And we have this, this huge issue 
of no recourse to public funds, so, which even our own prime minister not being that aware of, it is a major, major issue of people existing with nothing. And this, and this, and this concept of the crisis that at City of Sanctuary we've talked about a lot is that we're only safe when we're all safe. I think that's such a powerful message, you know, and if you can't meet your basic living needs, then you can't be safe and then we can't be safe. And, and, and through this crisis, we've seen hotels opening up, haven't we? we we've, seen, we've seen a government response, both national and local government responding to homeless people on the streets. We've seen some, by no means not enough, relaxation of the conditions around no recourse to public funds and showing that there is another way. And, and, and I hope coming out of this crisis that we can see more of a cross-sector campaign across the whole of civil society with a fundamental, clear, resounding message that no human being in this country should be destitute. It's such a wealthy country. And, and we've shown that there is a means to respond in this crisis. We need to keep responding to make sure that there is no destitution in the UK. And then, and then my final point about embedding a culture of welcome. I'm really proud to be national chair of City of Sanctuary UK. I hope many of you have heard of City of Sanctuary. Uh, we're a network of over 120 towns, cities, villages of sanctuary across the whole of the United Kingdom, the whole four nations of the United Kingdom. Um, and, and not just in that regard, we have universities of sanctuary, libraries of sanctuary, schools of sanctuary. There is this growing network. And a critical element for us has been embedding a culture of welcome, that local people come together and newcomers, refugees, asylum seekers, other people coming to a city or a town or a village, they are, they are welcome, they are helped to integrate. Uh, and historically, we've had this focus on refugees, and we're really proud of, of how we started in the great city of Sheffield over over 10 years ago. But this crisis has shown us that the importance of a culture of welcome isn't just in terms of welcoming refugees, as important as that is. It's about the whole community. It's almost kind of re-energized our mission that what we're doing is so vital that actually bringing all parts of the community together so that we can actually get to know each other. And a fundamental belief that we are stronger by coming together. But we can only do that if we have opportunities to meet, opportunities to come together. And I think in terms of City of Sanctuary, that's only energized and kind of galvanized our, our approach. So in conclusion, it's been an incredibly bleak and challenging time, but almost feel as though we've had a number of glimpses of what the world could be looked could look like and do we just as we kind of emerge out of lockdown do we just go back to the lazy default position of the injustices and the unfairness that we have seen endemic in our society or do we pause and observe some of the changes that we've seen and look that there can be another way on immigration detention you know why are we locking up people indefinitely there has to be a more just and a more humane approach the fact of destitution, that there are people in this great and wealthy country who are destitute, and that just should not be the case. And we need a persistent focus on that. And above all, we need to embed that culture of welcome so that we have effective and robust communities. So really hope that we don't slip back. It's been a hugely challenging time, but we've seen some, some glimpses, and we need to keep hold of those glimpses, I think and the campaigning energy cross-sector to get the change that we desperately need to see across the UK. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, that's given us so much to think about, so much to challenge us, uh, and it's been so encouraging to, to hear the passion with, with which you've spoken uh, and your own hands-on involvement with all, all the issues that, um, that are there. I'm going to start picking up on the questions. The first one I think is, is going to be a quick response and it can go around all four of you, but it's, you know, you, you've spoken very positively about the way churches should, should respond, well, you know, linking to the way churches should respond positively. So one question that's come in is when we do hear, and we all hear it, um, racist comments within in churches as institutions. We hear it from individuals and sometimes we'll hear um, 
you know, something that's not meant to be racist, it's unintentional, but it's there, we hear the undercurrent. How, how do you respond to that? How should you, we be responding to that? And, and this is picking up on Alan's point that the time for silence is past and we need action. So is it, would anyone like to go I can, first? I can take that. I guess maybe one of the things we're saying is that, you know, like the same thing we're, we're talking about that, you know, the blinkers are off. Anyone who said, I'm not aware, you know, that racism is real. I think that time has gone past. Nobody should be able to say that anymore. I think three things happen in, in a sequence and they all started out in the United States, but it then, you know, stream rolled into all of us here in Europe. You know, it started with um, Ahmad Aubrey's um, shooting by three brothers, uh, two brothers and a father who shot Ahmad Aubrey, and we saw that on live television. Then we had um, Amy Cooper, we, you know, we call it Karen, but Amy Cooper, um, who pretended and knew she was going to, she could get a black man killed, and she cried out false accusation on the phone to the police to say, this black man is threatening me, um, and it was recorded. We all saw that. And then we saw George Floyd killed, you know, and those three things happened in sequence. And what those three things did during COVID-19 was that we were all slow, we were all quiet, we were all in our homes. It gave us time to reflect. So right now, I think that no one of us should be able to say that racism is not real. So the blinkers are off. And that's why we're saying that the time for um, silence is gone. So key thing was saying, how should we respond? We need to unmute ourselves. Zoom has taught us and all of those things have taught us, unmute yourself, we keep saying, unmute yourself. So the same thing was saying, bystanders are not allowed. When there were bystanders on the day that George Floyd died, if they acted, that man would be alive. Every life counts. So we're saying, even as a church, as faith people, you know, as a nation, we cannot be bystanders anymore. We need to speak up. When we see it, we need to speak up. The last thing I would say, maybe just somebody else might want to agree, and I think that is the most important thing. The most important thing is that the weapon, the biggest weapon of racism is denial. But racism only uses one weapon. It uses denial. It tells you it's not happening. We live in this denial. So if faith people, if the church, if our nations, if your schools, your institutions, the first step to actually dealing with racism is to accept that racism is within the church. You know, we are nice people. We expect, you know, so, so nice people. One of the things I posted is that nice people do bad things. You know, so it's not a reflection. It's not whether you intended or not. So that is the first step. If we cannot accept that even in our nice, beautiful churches, that racism exists, that in our government parliaments and offices and schools that racism exists, we cannot do anything. So those are the two key things. Number one, no bystanders or mute yourself. If you see it, call it out, speak up. The second thing is that as a group, we must come to accept that racism exists. That is when we can reset and we can make the changes that we want to see. Thanks. That's good. I'm going to expand the question now in the light of, of what you've just said in that answer, because another very closely related question, but perhaps a, a, we'll get a stronger response still, is, and it's been said by you tonight, is about changing the narrative. And, and I, the question coming in around that is, um, has COVID-19 changed that narrative? Um, has it changed it positively with regard to immigration? And when we heard hints of that from what Jonathan was sharing, but just as a general thing as well, also how together do we go about changing the narrative? Who, who do we engage with to do that? How does that happen? What, what, what is your wisdom and your advice on that? Sally, can I have a, a, a quick few thoughts on that one? Um, mm -hmm. I, I was quite taken aback by the powerful sermon that William J. Barber gave in uh, Washington National Cathedral where he went straight to the prophet Amos and said that in the face of all the dying, we must have a lament. And I think one of the things that we are now finding in the UK and even more, dare I say, in the US, is that we are becoming sanitized to the huge number of people who have died. And that is something that churches can say uh, is not good enough. We cannot be silent in the face of such deaths and the number of deaths. And it is in that sense a time for us to lament. 
we must remember secondly very quickly for me is that we perhaps need to go back to the McPherson report um, that looked at that uh, that tragic death all those years ago, the Stephen Lawrence death. What we found there, that there was a systemic racism that was there in between the lines and the words and the sentences of our institutions. And still what we're finding is that churches are still complicit in that silence and in that institutional um, quietness in the face of having um, to speak. But the third thing for me is, and I think we need to do this with courtesy, where people can be persuaded, we need to persuade. And we make them excited by the prospect of a better and a more just world. But I remain very much convinced that whenever I hear anybody in church uh, starting a sentence by saying, um, I'm not a racist, but I will say kindly to them, quit while you're ahead before you reach the but. Mm, yeah, very true. Thanks, Aled. Aled, yeah, just to add on to uh, Alex, and um, I'd like to go back to what Jonathan was saying that I think using a community development approach, um, the churches cannot do it by themselves. We need communities, we need uh, the leaders that we've put in place to really look at all these issues. Uh, we need to lobby them. Um, I think the media, the portrayal of asylum seekers, of, of illegal migrants, of uh, refugees, that it's, it's confusing to, to most of uh, people living in communities. Uh, as the saying goes, charity begins at home. Uh, how are parents also speaking to their children? And um, what just happened with Black Lives Matter is just shed a light to say, let's look at history. How do these things come up? Uh, history showing slavery and the statues were put there. And most British people didn't know what those models did in the past. And most of them were slave owners. Most of them involved into uh, a lot of things that uh, are so inhumane. But I think it's also getting our leaders to, to come to us and tell us what they can do, not giving excuses because they were voted to do something they in place. We're given the votes and they have to try their best as well. So if there's a different perception of, of, of the voices going through our televisions, our radios, on, on social media, maybe the families will start picking up these things to say, we shouldn't divide, we're, we're the same. But there's that division, asylum seekers, some, some lead uh, politicians in America even calling asylum seekers as aliens. We've deported more aliens than before. So the, these name callings of human beings that, that, that should be on the same equal level uh, and, and also the barriers that we've put in place in, in our institutions. This person can get this, this person cannot get that, this student can get this, this student cannot get that. Also feeds in the mind of British people and and those who don't even want to be racist, it also say, so this person is different from me, I'm more than this person. So these words that have actually created barriers, if we can try to also uh, just demolish them and say, where is the equality here for, for everyone else who needs, who needs to be treated as a human being? But I think we need most of our politicians to really, um, uh, really engage into changing this and, and, and just making everything equal. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Jo Jonathan, do you want to add anything? And just, and just to say very briefly, I mean, I think the narrative has sh shifted slightly, but there you're already seeing a shift shifting back. You you're seeing the kind of default setting go back. And just to build on what Olivia was saying, and I think to me, how we how we fight back is it can't just be the church's refugee network or detention forum or city of sanctuary no civil society can't abdicate responsibility to these organizations and networks we're doing work in detention forum at the moment about building new allies who are the organizations that we can reach out to because we need more voices across wider civil society saying this is not being done in our name and that i think is the most effective way that you'll do it not just leaving it to the small refugee ngos and migrant charities and what have you to do that we need a much bigger sustained push from wider civil society. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm going to read out two things. I won't put these as questions. I'll move on to a question. <clears throat> but just to put two very strong points that have been made. Well, one is saying that that's, um, we need to learn how to have the difficult conversations. Just picking up on your response, Alid. 
um, when you know you take well stop before you get to the book which is true but but it's learning to have those difficult conversations when people say things that we really don't like um, and that that's that's hard but it is something I think we all need to take on board and the other one is is from Interject Bogle saying every church should become a church of sanctuary that we should look at the CTBI website all the resources are there and it should be embedded in the culture of welcome in in all churches and um, you know I suspect we'd all want well I think we'd all want to say amen for that I'm going to pick up on a on a specific question though as, as we move towards the end of our time which is to ask our contributors if you've noticed any increase in the LGBT asylum seekers um, through all, all this current time and if so is there any particular way we should be supporting them who would like to go first Jonathan you went last Last, last time. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to respond. So within Detention Forum, and I should have said, you know, we're, we're a network of over 40 organisations um, across the UK. W one of our members is a great charity called UK LGIG, and they are supporting um, lesbian gay people across the UK. And responding to the particular um, challenges that that community have in terms of trying to, um, to prove, to evidence, their asylum claim um, and I know that they are, are, are getting more and more calls coming through to them and I would certainly flag them up to as an organization a really really knowing about and then reaching out to and see how you could potentially support them because I think they are fulfilling a really important need across our community. Khaled? Unmute myself. Okay. Yeah, just one particular initiative that we picked up in Wales is that um, being aware of the needs of transgender individuals. Um, the Welsh Government made a very strong statement in support of them um, and sought to make sure that they were safe uh, within our midst. Uh, we've been acutely aware as churches of the need to be alongside LGBTQ uh, Christian Fellowship. As you know, Sally, we've got the gathering in City Church in Cardiff, uh, which has taken a very strong lead. I do think, uh, um, I was talking to one of the leaders last night, that they've really come around each other uh, and comforted each other. And one of the things that we're all learning, of course, is the, the, the benefits of Zoom. Uh, that we can actually keep fairly good contact with each other. Um, and I think particularly in the Welsh context that has taken place. Uh, but we should never forget that a failure to process an LGBTQ asylum seeker could very well mean that those individuals will lose their lives and to lose their lives in a very horrible way. Sorry, I, I was sorry, I'd, I'd muted myself, sorry. I was saying, Olivia, do you want to add anything to that, or Ivan? Uh, I don't have much information on that uh, for the last lockdown. Um, um, for, from what I'm aware of is, is that quite a number of LGBT um, asylum seekers have been afraid to really um, come out and speak more because of not being believed. Uh, when, whenever they put a claim that they are a, uh, so it's really been quite a hard time for, for, for most asylum seekers by LGBT. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then, Evan, did you want to add anything there? I, I think that here in Ireland, you know, we've begun to, we've begun to see a whole lot more visibility of LGBTQ um, I, um, asylum seekers here in Ireland. So I don't think they are increasing. I just think they are becoming more visible. Um, they are able to speak up a whole lot more. And I think that with all of the, you know, the Black Lives Matter and all of the COVID-19, there's a huge reset that happened in the system, you know, and people had a, bit, a, a little level of boldness. You know, what, what we've seen here, we've seen young people, you know, began to talk about their experiences of racism in schools. So this has been in our papers. And so we've seen a lot of webinars and conferences, you know, and articles you know, by LGBTQ asylum seekers here in Ireland. So yes, it, they, they are speaking up a whole lot more. And I think that 
you know, what we can do is, you know, we must be conscious of intersectionality, you know, irrespective of what we believe, what our faith says, that we must look at people's intersectionality, you know, so whether it's, you know, mixed with their gender or mixed with their race or mixed with their age or mixed with their sexuality, that for us to fully care, for us to truly care, we must see people as a mixture of intersectionality. And that just the same way you can't separate, you know, my black and my woman, you know, and it's all of those things and that we're looking at. That being becoming invisible, we must be mindful of that. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to give one final question. I hope you won't mind. It'll take us just a couple of minutes over, but perhaps if you could answer this very, very briefly, but it's something that was raised earlier on. It's very pertinent in the light of everything that you've all been saying. It's to ask what is your main concern about the 2020 immigration bill? Evan, would you like to go first on that one? And if it's nothing particular, then that's fine. We can move yeah, on. Yes, so I think because it's a, it's a UK immigration bill. So again, so maybe I think those of you who are in the UK would look at the bill, you know, but again, I mean, we know from the UK, it's been, you know, in the last few years, it's been massively anti-immigrant. It's been anti-immigration, you know, so I don't know the contents of the bill, so I can't speak to it. But there's honestly, from everything that come out from the UK concerning immigration has been negative. It has been pushed the immigrant out. You know, um, a piece of research that came out that I saw today online was talking about, you know, in, in, um, in 2100, you know, that, you know, the population is going to become a whole lot older. Europe is going to, you know, the population population is going to decrease and we're going to need that there will actually be a competition for immigrants. We will actually be looking for immigrants and that's what it says there you know because of you know our, our birth rate has gone down in Europe to to two points um, to less than two less than two you know so so that report actually said that we are actually going to be competing as nations for immigrants so that would be an interesting um, thing you know and um, so I would let maybe others who've read that bill talk about it. Thank you. Sally, 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 may I just quickly respond. Um, from the Welsh point of view, uh, one of the things that we explored uh, as the bill was being mooted was um, would we be possible to have uh, the four nations have uh, their own policies and even to break that down in devolution to the English regions and cities? because the threshold of uh, preventing people coming here, the financial threshold, is completely unrealistic for the Welsh context. It means that uh, effectively, uh, that if you go to New Zealand, for example, as a Welsh uh, person to learn how to do farming and you fall in love with someone, it basically means that you can't come back ever to live here with your partner uh, because the financial threshold is such. And that level of, um, of hardship on individuals it doesn't rest well um, with the uh, with the Christian faith, and I think I would like to have adaptability within the bill, uh, but I doubt very much whether that centralised sense uh, within the UK government would allow that to happen. And maybe Sally, I can jump in. Um, my concern around the immigration bill, you won't be surprised to hear, is the lack of a time limit on immigration detention. It, it, it just remains, it's just so, it's so wrong, it's so outrageous that can, people can be detained indefinitely with no time limit, who committed no, no, no crime because of their immigration status. And we need to see that changed and that change within the immigration bill. Well, my worry for me is just uh, looking at how the the asylum seekers and, and, and those that are, have got no recourse to public fund and those that are destitute, how they, they'll, they'll be experiencing food poverty. Uh, we, we're going to have a higher number of people going through that at the moment and, uh, and, and with COVID not going away, I, I, I worry so much about these people that, that they actually don't have any financial support so that and and I, I, I'm, I'm not yet I, I hope the the, the 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 communities will be able to to fight that off and 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 write to the parliament to say you need to change this just to make it more a bit human for for everybody else 
Thank you. I'm going to have to draw it to a close. We've run out of time. But could I please thank you all for, for, for all you've contributed. I feel this has been a bit like an iceberg this evening, but we've, we've dealt with a little bit, you know, that we've had time to on the surface, but it's all there and it's all real and it all matters. And, and together as we go forward, hopefully we'll, we'll find positive ways of addressing this. So first of all, thank you so much to our four speakers, to Olivia, to Eben, to Aled, and to Jonathan. And thank you all of you who've been on this webinar with us. I do apologize if we didn't get to your question. We covered as many as you could. So um, as I say, I'm Sally. So on behalf of the Church's Refugee Network, thank you all so much for attending this evening and we'll see what happens as we go forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.